Good afternoon. On behalf of the consistory and deacons, we extend a warm welcome to all guests and members and those who may be live streaming to this worship service. The offertory in this service is for the deacons, for their work of, mis uh, for their work of mercy. This afternoon, we welcome to the pulpit Brother Raul Kingma. May the Lord bless you with strength as you preach God's word to us. And may we as congregation be edified and receive this word with thanksgiving. And may our great God in heaven be glorified and praised as we come before him in worship. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. If you're able, please rise and let us worship the Lord. As we approach our triune God, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Receive his greeting. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. Amen. Let's praise this glorious God together with Psalm 68, stanzas 1 and 2. Brothers and sisters, let's now confess the faith once delivered to all the saints, the faith of the church of all times and places with the words of the Apostles' Creed using hymn one.
let's now come before our Heavenly Father and ask for his blessing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty and Eternal God, you alone are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things with just a word, the galaxies, the land and the sea, the rich variety of life that fills our planet, and us, men and women, boys and girls who bear your divine image. It would all disappear in an instant if you would withdraw your hand. Father, we marvel at your wisdom and your power. There is none like you, O Lord. You alone are worthy of worship. And we have come to worship you. We want to worship you. And we delight to do so. We delight to find rest in your presence, to stand before you as your people, and to behold your glory and your beauty. We come humbly, Father, for we know how sinful we are. There is no strength in us. We deserve judgment, not mercy, wrath, and not love. And yet we come, and we pray that you would receive us for the sake of Jesus Christ. And as we open your word, show us once again who you are and what you have done for us in Jesus. Satisfy us with the rich food of the gospel. Root us more deeply in Christ. Strengthen our weak knees and our feeble hands by the power of your word. And by your Holy Spirit, take away our blindness and our rebellion so that we would receive your word, so that we would see your light and grant your servant strength to proclaim that word boldly and in truth. All this we ask for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We'll now turn to our scripture reading. The sermon will be on Jeremiah 45. And we're going to read Jeremiah 36, verses 1 through 26. If you've ever read through Jeremiah, you've probably noticed that it's not organized chronologically. Events don't always happen they're not always recorded in the order they happen, and events that happen at the same time are in different parts of the book, and that's the case here. The events in Jeremiah 36 and Jeremiah 45 take place in the same year. So let's read Jeremiah 36, starting at verse 1. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them so that everyone may turn from his evil way and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah and Baruch wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah ordered Baruch, saying, I am banned from going to the house of the Lord, so you are to go. And on a day of fasting, in the hearing of all the people in the Lord's house, you shall read the words of the Lord from the scroll that you have written at my dictation. You shall read them also in the hearing of all the men of Judah who come out of their cities. It may be that their plea for mercy will come before the Lord and that everyone will turn from his evil way, for great is the anger and wrath that the Lord has pronounced against this people. And Baruch, the son of Neriah, did all that Jeremiah the prophet ordered him about reading from the scroll the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. In the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people in Jerusalem and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before the Lord. Then in the hearing of all the people, Baruch read the words of Jeremiah from the scroll in the house of the Lord, 
in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the secretary, which was in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. When Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the scroll, he went down to the king's house, into the secretary's chamber, and all the officials were sitting there. Elishama, the secretary, Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the officials. And Micaiah told them all the words, all the words that he had heard when Baruch read the scroll in the hearing of the people. Then all the officials sent Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, son of Shelemiah, son of Cushi, to say to Baruch, take in your hand the scroll that you read in the hearing of the people and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand and came to them. And they said to him, sit down and read it. So Baruch read it to them. When they heard all the words, they turned to one another in fear. And they said to Baruch, we must report all these words to the king. Then they asked Baruch, tell us, please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? Baruch answered them, he dictated all these words to me while I wrote them with ink on the scroll. Then the officials said to Baruch, go and hide, you and Jeremiah, and let no one know where you are. So they went into the court to the king, having put the scroll in the chamber of Elisha, the secretary, and they reported all the words to the king. Then the king sent Jehudai to get the scroll, and he took it from the chamber of Elisha, the secretary, and Jehudai read it to the king and all the officials who stood beside the king. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter house, and there was a fire burning in the fire pot before him. As Jehudai read three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Yet neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words was afraid, nor did they tear their garments. Even when Elnathan and Deliah and Gemariah urged the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them. And the king commanded Jeremiel, the king's son, and Sariah, the son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdiel, to seize Baruch, the secretary, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But the Lord hid them. This is the word of the Lord. And as we prepare to hear that, the proclamation of the gospel, let's sing together from Psalm 77, stanzas 1 and 2.
The text for this afternoon is Jeremiah chapter 45, which contains a message from the Lord for Baruch. So let's read that chapter together now. Jeremiah 45, starting at verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he wrote these words in a book at the dictation of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. You said, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built I am breaking down, and what I have planted I am plucking up, that is, the whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. So far, our text. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, have you ever found yourself thinking that it might be easier not to be a Christian? Have you ever found yourself thinking that life might possibly be better if you were not a Christian? Maybe it's happened to you while you're here in church, you think about all the things that you could be doing instead of sitting here listening to yet another sermon. And the thought strikes you, wouldn't it be nice to be free of all of this? Is it really worth it? Or perhaps it was something more serious. Maybe in a college or university class, you realize that if you say what you actually think about some hot button topic, abortion or gender, that it could affect your grade. Or you realize at work that your Christian convictions could cost you a promotion or a contract, or at least get you mocked. And the thought crosses your mind. Maybe life would be easier if I weren't a Christian. Maybe the cost is too high. There are times in your life when the cost of following Jesus Christ suddenly stares you in the face. And sadly, for some, that's when they turn away. But even if you're serious about walking with the Lord, those moments can leave you feeling discouraged or anxious. How can I possibly follow Christ faithfully when it starts to hurt? Isn't it going to be too hard? Now in our text, we see someone who's wrestling with these sorts of questions, this man, Baruch. And the Lord has a message for him but also for us, to spur us on to continued faithfulness. So I may proclaim to you the gospel of Jeremiah 45 under this theme. The Lord comes with a bracing message for the troubled believer. And we'll work through the text in three parts. First, we'll see the believer's lament. Second, the Lord's rebuke. And finally, the Lord's promise. So let's start with the believer's lament. But before we come to the specifics, we need to set some of the context. Our text contains one of the prophecies of Jeremiah, and he lived roughly 600 years before Christ. He worked in and around Jerusalem, and for about 40 years, God spoke to the people of Judah through this prophet. Now, these were dark times for the people of God. About a hundred years before Jeremiah's ministry, the northern tribes of Israel had been scattered, carried off by Assyria, because they had rejected the Lord. But Judah in the south didn't learn from any of this. Instead, they followed down the same path. They rejected God. They served idols, even in the temple. There was so much apostasy. 
And so they also were on the path toward disaster and judgment. Now by the time Jeremiah comes onto the scene, Josiah is king of Judah. And Josiah was a bright spot in all of this. He was a godly king. And he strove to bring Judah back to God. He purged the temple of idolatry. He desecrated the high places. He put away the idols and abominations from the land of Judah. But even this was not enough to escape the coming judgment of God. Because the hearts of the people had not really changed. And the kings after Josiah lapse right back into wickedness. And that's the situation of Jeremiah 45. Josiah has been dead for about four years. It's now the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. And Jehoiakim is a wicked king. Under his leadership, Judah has continued to reject the Lord. And in this context of Judah's apostasy, the fourth year of Jehoiakim becomes very important. It's during this year that Jeremiah prophesies judgment in very specific terms. The nations, including Judah, shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Jeremiah 25. And in that same year, this prophecy begins to take on reality. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians defeat the Egyptians in a very important battle near the Euphrates. Now, under this, until this point, Egypt was the main world power. They had even put Jehoiakim on the throne. But now Jehoiakim's main ally is on the run from Nebuchadnezzar. And in the aftermath of this battle, Nebuchadnezzar's army comes right to the doors of Jerusalem. He makes Jehoiakim change allegiance from Egypt to Babylon. He carries away the temple treasures and, and some of the upper class people. You can think here of Daniel and his friends. Judah is now under the thumb of Babylon. And this marks a major political change for Judah, an ominous change for those with eyes to see because God's judgment is knocking on the door and the time for repentance has grown awfully short. So during this same year, the fourth year of Jehoiakim, God commands Jeremiah to write down all his prophecies to give the people one more chance to repent. Jeremiah 36, verse 2, take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah until today. Now at this point, that's 23 years worth of prophecies that have to get put into writing. And because this is 2,600 years ago, meaning Jeremiah did not have a laptop with voice to text, he needed the real living version. He needed a scribe. And that's how Baruch comes into the picture. Baruch is the man commissioned to write as Jeremiah dictates. And we don't know a lot about Baruch otherwise. He was probably trained as a professional scribe. It seems that he was from a fairly prominent family. Later in Jeremiah, it says that his brother had connections to the monarchy. But whatever the case, it's clear that Baruch was not merely a hired hand. He becomes a close and loyal companion of Jeremiah. He speaks on Jeremiah's behalf. He's intimately involved in Jeremiah's affairs. The two men are closely associated. Jehoiakim wants them both arrested, for instance, in Jeremiah 36. And they're listed together among those who many years later go down to Egypt. Baruch becomes Jeremiah's follower, his disciple, so to speak. And at some point in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, when Baruch is writing out the prophecies and with Babylon flexing its muscle on the international scene, the Lord comes with this message for Baruch. Verse 2, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. Now this message comes at a time when Baruch is really struggling. Listen to verse 3, where the Lord repeats Baruch's own words. Woe is me, 
For the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Those are heavy words. Words of a man who feels like he cannot carry on. His shoulders are sagging as the burdens pile up. Sorrow on top of pain. Distress on top of grief. I am weary and I find no rest. He's at the end of his rope. But why exactly? What's going on with Baruch here? Well, he may be anxious about Judah's future because of all the recent political turmoil. Their main ally, Egypt, has been defeated. Babylon has already disrupted life in Jerusalem. So for Baruch, there's uncertainty about the future. Where is all of this going to go for Judah? Is there a future for the people of God? But there's a more significant reason for Baruch's lament. Because Baruch is facing a very difficult task. He doesn't only have to write out the prophecies. Jeremiah 36 says that Jeremiah ordered Baruch to go to the temple to read these prophecies in the hearing of all the people. And this is not just a fear of public speaking. Just a couple of years earlier, Jeremiah had gone to the temple to prophesy. And do you know how that ended? With the people grabbing hold of Jeremiah and shouting, you shall die. Jeremiah 26. And now Jeremiah is banned from the temple, so Baruch has to go. Would you be eager to do that? Baruch has an unpleasant and possibly dangerous task ahead of him. He has to proclaim the truth to what might be a hostile audience. You can imagine what Baruch must have been thinking. Read this in the temple. How is that going to affect my relationships, my prospects, my future? Am I even going to make it out of there in one piece? As he thinks about this task, Baruch is being forced to come to grips with the cost, the high cost of following Jeremiah. He's going to share in his suffering and his persecution. He may well become an outsider to his own people. And as he comes to realize just how high this cost is, it leaves him weary and full of sorrow. Now, you and I don't follow Jeremiah but we do follow the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater and chief prophet. And brothers and sisters, following Christ also comes with a high cost. Jesus taught us this. A servant is not greater than his master, he says. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. John 15. And it's elsewhere, Acts 14, verse 22. Paul and Barnabas preach that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And then there's the examples of the suffering. 2 Corinthians 11 gives us a litany of all the things that Paul suffered. He was whipped five times. He was beaten with rods three times. He was stoned once. And he was constantly in danger. And church history since then has many more examples. Christians who were ridiculed, exiled, martyred for the faith, sometimes by the church itself. Brothers and sisters, to be a Christian is to share in the sufferings of Christ. To be a Christian is to suffer with our Savior. So have you counted the cost of following Christ? Have you ever spent any time reflecting on it? It can be easy to ignore. For many decades, persecution has been something that happens elsewhere. But what if the time comes when you are called on to suffer for Christ? Maybe you've already experienced that in some way. What if you face an online mob because you refuse to take photos for a gay wedding? What if your job or your business or your grades are put in jeopardy because of your Christian convictions on something like pronouns or sexuality? Have you counted the cost? And when you think about that, 
Where does it leave you? Does it worry you? Does it leave you feeling anxious, distressed, a little like Baruch? Then what the Lord is going to say to Baruch is also for you. And I want you to notice something about this message. Many of Jeremiah's prophecies are to the movers, addressed to the movers and shakers of the world, the kings, the nations, Israel and Judah. But here, the Lord gives Jeremiah a personal message for Baruch right when he needs it. And that says something about what God is like. You know, it can be tempting to think of God a little bit like a CEO. He's the CEO of the universe. He's busy with the big things, running the world, making important decisions. But he doesn't have time for me sitting in cubicle number nine on the first floor. He's got more important things to do. That's not the case, brothers and sisters. God is not your CEO. He is your father. And he is concerned with the lives of each and every one of his children, including you. So he reaches down here with a personal message for Baruch, but also for you and for me. So let's find out what the Lord says. That brings us to our second point, the Lord's rebuke. The Lord begins his response to Baruch in verse 4 with these words, Thus you, Jeremiah, shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built I am breaking down, and what I have planted I am plucking up. That is, the whole land. Notice the imagery there, planting and uprooting, building and tearing down. God is the world's gardener. He plants the peoples of the earth in their place. And God is also the builder. He builds the nations and makes them strong. So when he says that he's breaking down and uprooting, it means he's coming in judgment. God is walking through the earth, so to speak, with a sledgehammer in one hand and a shovel in the other, sweeping away the nations that are before him. And that judgment would begin with Judah. The temple would be destroyed and Jerusalem leveled and the people carried away. But it wouldn't stop there. Verse 5 says, I am bringing disaster on all flesh. And even in verse 4, it speaks of the whole land, but you could translate that as the whole earth. Judgment will ripple outwards from Judah to all the nations, Egypt, Philistia, even Babylon, Jeremiah 25. Now the Lord is not doing this because he has some sort of perverse delight in destruction. No. He's uprooting what has become rotten to prepare the way for a future restoration. In Jeremiah 24, verse 6, the Lord says about Judah, I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. It's the same imagery. But that's for the future. In our text, the Lord emphasizes to Baruch that now is the time for judgment. I am breaking down. I am plucking up. And then he gets to the heart of the matter. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Now is not the time, Baruch. I'm turning the world upside down. And that is going to affect you. And this rebuke gives us a picture of what's really going on in Baruch's heart. His sorrow and distress is motivated in large part by a kind of selfishness. It's not really clear what great things Baruch was seeking. Maybe he was hoping for a prominent position in Jerusalem. Maybe he just wanted a stable and comfortable life. But whatever the case, if he reads Jeremiah's prophecies in the temple, that probably isn't going to happen. Baruch is distressed because his idea of how his life should go is being turned upside down by the Lord, and he's struggling with that. So what about you? 
Let's come back to that earlier question. When you come face to face with the cost of following Christ, where does it leave you? Does the thought of persecution or loss leave you distressed? That's certainly a possibility. But then we have to ask ourselves why we feel this way. Why does the cost of following Christ bother us? And if we're really honest, is it not often because we are seeking great things for ourselves? Because we want to be comfortable? Because we don't want to lose status and become outsiders? And how does that affect your actions? Do you actively avoid following Christ when you know it will hurt because you're worried about what it will cost? Staying silent when you know that you should speak up? Or not speaking truthfully about what you believe? Are you seeking great things for yourself? God's word comes to us here and says, Seek them not. Seek them not. For we too live in a time when God brings his judgments upon the earth. That's as true in the new covenant as it was in the old. And when God's judgments come on the church and the world, you are going to be affected even if you are faithful. The Holy Spirit tells us this in 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And then verse 17 explains, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. God is still in the business of plucking up and tearing down. And that can mean fiery trials for Christians. And do you seek great things for yourself? Brothers and sisters, when we struggle with this, it should drive us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ never sought great things for himself. He did quite the opposite. Philippians 2, verse 6 says, Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The Lord Jesus gave up his heavenly glory. He gave up what was rightfully his and made himself nothing. He did not seek great things for himself. But his humility has won great things for you, brothers and sisters. By humbling himself to death on a cross, he, he bought forgiveness he made himself low so that you could be restored to fellowship with God. So have you been seeking great things for yourself? Then repent. Turn away from those things and turn to Christ in faith and find forgiveness for these sins, for all your sins. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can begin to walk as Christ walked, in humility. And that's good news, brothers and sisters. But there's more good news in this passage, and that brings us to our third point, the Lord's promise. The Lord in his mercy does not end this message with an admonition. But he adds a promise at the end of verse 5. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all the places to which you may go. Your life as a prize of war. In the coming war of God's judgment on Judah and the nations, the Lord will keep Baruch safe. And that would have been encouraging, don't you think? Baruch knows he may lose everything. He may become an outsider. He may have to leave his homeland, but now he knows that no matter what happens, he will have his life. And the Lord was faithful to this promise to Baruch. 
In Jeremiah 36, Baruch goes and reads the scroll at the temple. The scroll is brought to King Jehoiakim, who burns it, lighting the Bible on fire, piece by piece. And then he goes after Baruch and Jeremiah. In verse 26, the king commanded his men to seize Baruch the secretary and Jeremiah the prophet. And then those glorious words, but the Lord hid them. He saved Baruch's life. And 20 years later, after Jerusalem has been flattened by the Babylonians, we find out that Baruch is still alive. In Jeremiah 43, verse 6, there he is in a list of people carried off to Egypt. The Lord gave him his life in all the places where he had to go. And yet Baruch did eventually die. He was kept alive for 20 years at least, but he's no longer here. And so this promise is pointing towards something even better. And that something is again found in Jesus Christ. He, like Baruch, had to face the judgment of God. But for Jesus, there was no way out. He did not get to keep his life. He died under the weight of God's wrath against sin. But when he rose from the dead, he opened up a path through judgment for you. Baruch escaped through God's judgment to continue his earthly life. But in Christ, you pass through judgment to eternal life. Christ says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. John 5. And eternal life, brothers and sisters, is not just about staying alive. It's not eternal survival. It's eternal life. Capital L. Life in communion with Christ. Life that is full, where there's joy and pleasures forevermore. Our happiest moments those moments that you wish would never end are just a faint picture of eternal life with Christ. It's a life so beautiful that you won't ever want it to end. But notice that Christ says, whoever believes has eternal life. Present tense. Believe in Christ and this life is yours already now. It may be hidden, it may not be in full bloom yet, but it is yours. And nothing can take it away. Not difficulty or trial, not sickness or persecution or death, not even the final judgment of God, nothing. You have passed from death to life. So how does that help you? when the cost of following Christ stares you in the face. It doesn't take away that cost. You could lose a lot. Status, possessions, friendships. And yet you would lose nothing that really matters because you will have your life. If anyone would come after me, Christ says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world with all its great things and forfeits his soul? Oh, the path through judgment to life is not easy, brothers and sisters. The cost of following Christ is high, but it is worth it. So don't lose heart. Don't fear. For you will have your life as a prize of war, of Christ's war, in which he's making all things new. Amen. In response to the proclamation of God's word, let's sing from hymn 55, stanzas 1, 2, and 3.
Let's now pray and give thanks to God. Merciful God and Father, we stand amazed at your mighty works of salvation. We deserve judgment. We are no better than anyone else in this world. And yet you have opened up a path for us through judgment to life. Father, there are no words that can express our gratitude, our praise for what you have done. You have saved our lives. And yet, Father, the path before us can be so difficult to walk. So often, we are captivated by the great things of this world. When you send trials and difficulties, we so often want to turn away. Father, forgive us. Do not hold these sins against us. Help us to constantly fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and to follow him no matter what it may cost. Never let us lose sight of our hope, Father, the hope of eternal life, the hope of a kingdom that cannot be shaken and a new creation that will never pass away. Father, there are still so many in this world who have not heard the word of life and who stand condemned in your coming judgment. Father, you have told us that you do not delight in the death of the wicked, that you desire all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So we pray earnestly that you would have mercy on these people whom you have made. Lead them to the truth. Deliver them from the stranglehold of sin and Satan. Reconcile them to yourself through Jesus Christ. Lead people to visit our congregation to hear the gospel and grant us opportunities to tell them about the love of Christ and to show that love to them in our words and actions. May we be your instruments in leading people from death to life. Grant your blessing also on mission work and evangelism. We pray that you'd bless the work of Reverend Campen and the Reformational Study Center. Give him and all those involved strength, joy, and stamina for the work. And may it bear much fruit in your kingdom. We also pray for the ministry of the word in this place. Give the elders and deacons what they need. Courage, boldness, wisdom, gentleness, and patience as they shepherd and guide and encourage your people. And grant that we would make their task a joy and not a burden. And we pray also that you provide this congregation with the gift of a pastor of its own. Heavenly Father, grant your blessing as we depart and begin a new week. Strengthen us for the tasks that you give us. Uphold us in your almighty hands and keep us on the narrow path that leads to the glorious new Jerusalem. All this we pray for the sake of Jesus Christ, our beloved Lord. Amen. You now have an opportunity to give to those who are in need. The collection this afternoon will be for the Ministry of Mercy. And after the collection, we'll sing our final song, Hymn 35, stanzas 1, 2, and 4.
brothers and sisters, receive the blessing of your God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.